people think that the way to make an appeal or a message more successful is what you put into the message. And that's those seven principles, mm -hmm. right? So that's true. But it turns out there's research to show what you say or do before you ever send your message puts people in a... I think you gotta have a dream. The school of greatness. <laughs> yeah. Please welcome Lewis House. The first one, which is, I think, um, is reciprocity, reci reciprocation, I guess you'd call it. Yeah. Why is that? It's kind of like the old give and take, you know, let me give you something and then you want to give me something in return. How did that come about as a main, I guess, law of, of influence for you? Well, you know, it came about in the way that all of them did, which was um, that I decided I needed to get out of my laboratory and off my college campus to really understand what were the factors that moved people powerfully and consistently in the direction of a communicator's request or proposal or recommendation. And I did it by answer, uh, answering ads for... Um, uh, to be uh, trained to be trained in any of the major influence professions of our society, I took training in how to sell automobiles, how to sell insurance, how to sell portrait photography. Uh, photography over the phone uh, but I didn't stop there I also did the same thing infiltrated training programs incognito disguised identity disguised intent they didn't know why I was there I was there to learn what they had learned over decades and decades of what moves people in their direction. So I did that with fundraisers I did it with recruiters I even did it with cult uh, specialists. Really? How do the cults get us to move into their their orbit and keep us there? Uh, and what I looked for were the commonalities. What worked across all of those various influence professions whose economic livelihood, after all, depends on the success of getting people to say yes to, to them? And what I found just shocked me in how small the footprint was. I only counted six universal principles of influence that seemed to work in each of those domains to move people. And the first one, as you rightly suggested, was the rule for reciprocation that says people feel a drive to give back to others who have first given to them. Right, so there are a lot. There are a lot of different ways that we can move people in our direction. One is if people see that they owe us, they say yes to us. They say yes to the next request we make of them. So what it means is that we have to go first. We have to give benefits. We have to give information. We have to give advantages. We have to give concessions. And that, come, that flows back to us by the rule that exists in every human culture. Turns out the anthropologists have shown us there's not a single human society that fails to train its, its youth in this rule. You must really? not take without giving in return. So what it tells me is that we have to flip the script of the usual business arrangement with people where we say to them you do something for us first you buy my product you sign my contract you make a an agreement with me a commitment to me and then i will give back to you what i i oh, hope you, you, you yeah, will yeah. accept <laughs> yeah this one says yeah that's fine but there's another route where we go first we give and then people want, by this rule, to give to us. There's a lovely study that was, it's not even published yet, um, uh, conducted in McDonald's restaurants in Colombia and Brazil, so you know, in South America, where they did a promotion one week. Every family that came in, the kids got a balloon as a nice thank you for coming in. Half of them got the balloon as they were leaving. Each of the kids got a balloon. Thank you for you know patronizing McDonald's. Please come again. 
The other half got the balloon as they entered. Those families... Sales went up, yeah. 25% more food. Wow. Now, here's the thing I love. For a balloon. For a balloon. A simple little 10-cent balloon. For a balloon. Now, here's the thing I love about that. If you look into the data closely, that 25% increase in buy included 20% higher coffee orders. The kids weren't offering getting the coffee. The parents were. The, the parents were grateful for what their kids got, and they were going to buy more. This has to do with the last principle that we'll talk about later, the principle of unity. But here's the takeaway. <laughs> Any favor you do for my child, you have done for me. Interesting. You make my child happy, I'm happier, and I want to thank you. And I'm good. That's right. I'm not just thankful. I'm obligated. Uh. I'm, I'm both grateful and obligated by this rule to, to give in return. Why so do we feel? Yeah, why do we feel this obligation? Is it trained culturally or society? Is it? kind of innate in our human DNA or our psychology or the way our brain works, the chemistry, why are we, why do we feel obligated to give something in return when someone gives something to us? Because the first of your uh, uh, candidates, I think, is the, is the major one, that we are socialized from childhood into this rule it, because that rule, if it exists in any culture, makes the culture thrive because people give back and forth they they it allows them to to be specialized in a particular area where they can have an input and then somebody gives them something that they don't have in their particular area and it also allows people to cooperate toward a common goal if this rule didn't exist why would I ever give something first to you right. <laughs> with the risk of losing it? Right. For the first time in evolutionary history now, there's a rule that allows us to give something without giving it away. We don't give it away. It comes back to us. Mm. And so we're now freed to begin economic exchanges that require that we trust the other person will not just take this so you know in in every human language uh, we have very nasty names for people who take without giving in return and we don't want to be saddled with those names i know in english we call them moochers right yes <laughs> I, i've been that in my life when i had no money and i was broke and i was sleeping on my sister's couch for about a year and a half i was a moocher because i was like uh, and it doesn't feel good you know, no. mooching, mooching off my sister, no. eating her food, you know, pa not paying rent, not working. And I was like, that's when I started studying your work. <laughs> and and <laughs> so you, can't, not be a moocher. you can't wait. I mean, you're on the balls of your feet oh, waiting no. to get in a position to help in return when she yes. might need something. Oh, and that's that's all I wanted to do is constantly give yeah. back. It's, it's funny because I was talking about this a couple of days ago, actually. For the last, I don't know, eight years, I feel very uncomfortable when I go to dinner or lunch or coffee with someone, I feel very uncomfortable for them paying for me. I almost always pay, almost always, unless someone is like somehow sneaks their credit card in before me with the, you know, with the waiter or something. And it's because for almost two years, I couldn't, like everyone else had to pay for me. Yeah. And I feel I, I feel obligated to pay the debt back. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I feel obligated. It's been a decade and I still feel like, ah, I just need to keep paying and paying like, I feel the obligation and, you know, I don't feel bad about it. It just feels hard to receive because I know that right. was a mooch for almost two years. And, uh, you know, you're, I, I believe you're close with Adam Grant who talks about yeah. this in his book, Give and Take. And then there's another book called Giftology by John Rulin. I'm not yes. sure if you've heard of Giftology. Both of those I've yeah. read and recommend. Yeah. The principles of kind of giving first and not waiting for someone to buy, but giving first. I'm curious, in the online marketing world where it seems like every website is trying to give you something to opt in, is there ever too much uh, saturation of giving 
where people or it diminishes the opportunity to connect or for someone to opt in or to buy. Is there ever kind of too much saturation where it uh, numbs us or yeah. is this always going to work? Well, it, it is diminished where we don't see the gift as something genuine, but just as a device that you give to everybody. It's not, you don't, you're not trying to benefit me. You're trying to just get me to feel uh, obligated. So for me, there's good evidence on this. It, the more we can personalize what we give, the more people feel like they really want to give back. And uh, here's another study that shows that. It's also in a fast food restaurant. People came into the shop and half of them were greeted warmly and then uh, went to the counter. Another group of them was given a gift, a little uh, key ring, a nice expensive key ring. Right? And a th the third group was given a small cup of yogurt. Now, those who were given the key ring bought 12% more food than those who weren't given anything, just as we said, right? But those given the yogurt bought 24% more food. Why? Why is that? Why do you go to a restaurant? Because you're hungry. You're hungry. So if you give you're, me some food. You, I've personalized the gift to your challenges, your needs, yeah. what you prefer in that moment. And I double wow. your likelihood. So it's not a random gift. It's something you came in for already, some right. hunger. Now, I wonder... If they did an extra study where it said you get to choose the flavor, and it was specialized to you even more, I wonder if that how that would work. But uh, that's a that's interesting. I don't know. <laughs> uh, there's uh, there's another principle of social proof that we'll yes. get to later. Yes. That says if um, I let's say it's a dessert, it was in a McDonald's, and they have various kinds of, uh, of, of uh, uh, additions you can put on, you know, mm -hmm. uh, sprinkles yes. or Cookies Oreos. Or whatever, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. If, you, if you tell people what the most um, popular addition is, uh, it, it raises the willingness to get additions by 45 percent wow so we'll get to that yes. the idea that yes. uh, you can ask people and give them an option and tell them in the in the process what a lot of people like them prefer yes That's, i think uh, yeah i think of seized candy um where you go in they give you a piece of free chocolate like you get to kind of pick the chocolate yeah yeah if you're liking it's like yeah i want this yeah. piece and they always give a free piece of chocolate right. To anyone. And sometimes they'll give you a couple pieces where right. it's like, now I want to buy more. It's just this feeling of obligation of like, of course I want to buy. It. And just the fact that you know you can go into the store and get a free piece. You could walk out if you want to, but just right. the knowing I can go into C's candy store, I can get a piece of chocolate if I want. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to feel like obligated, so I'm going to do it anyways. But um, to, to, to your question, yep. how do you do this online? Yes. Right? How do you personalize? Well, if you have a particular expertise right? And you know that people are following you because they want that particular thing. You give them something like the top three things you can do to enhance your success on this particular topic, in this particular dimension that you're, that you're here for. Here, or here are the top five mistakes that people should avoid. In in buying insurance or selecting, uh, you know, uh, 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 motorcycle parts, what whatever it is, right? It shouldn't be something that specifically enhances your business, because that is seen as a device now. That's just you're just promoting yourself. No, what will make you a better consumer, a better uh, reviewer, a better uh, decision maker in this particular field. Give that first. Right. People will feel indebted as for that. Yeah, I'm always of the, of the mindset of like, 
give as much of your best stuff up front for yeah. free, like give as much value as possible and, and let people just be like, man, this is unbelievable. This is the authority, which we'll go into in a little bit later. And when you showcase your value and people realize, wow, no one else in this space is giving like this. I trust right. this person more. I like this person more. You know, all the things that we're going to talk about here. Is there I a, agree with you on yeah. that. And there, there are there are people who argue with me that, no, 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 don't give away your best stuff. No, no, don't, you'll save that. Wait a minute. How do people know what your best stuff is right. <laughs> unless you give them a sample of it? you got to give a sample. Is there a diminishing return based on the season of your gift giving? For example... It doesn't seem like there is with Seize Candy. When people come in, they've been doing this for probably decades where you get a free piece of chocolate. But talking about it in maybe the online marketing world or online business world, if you're just giving the same PDF or video series or audio series for three, five, ten years in a row, are there diminishing returns for that season? Should we be changing up the, the give every six to 12 months? Have you seen any research around that? Yes, we should, because it turns out that what we give, if it is new, if it is unexpected, it increases the likelihood of uh, the amount that people give back to us. Interesting. Um, and uh, because it's, once again, not just the same thing. It's it's more personalized. It's you, You've updated it for us. So that makes it feel, uh, you know, more... Um, Thoughtful. Unique, yeah, unique and 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 rare and interesting and all these things. Yeah. Um, what else around reciprocation should we be aware of? That's important for us. And we, is there any downside? Yeah. To, well, to how much you can give. Like, is there? Yeah. You know, um, I'm spending so much money on this give, and it's not working in terms of making me money. Is there a downside there? Well, there is a downside, and uh, I'll give you an example of uh, uh, what. Uh, I found is a mistake that people make. After they have done something that is truly beneficial to uh, uh, a group or an audience or an individual, let's say an individual, you've done something and that person comes back to you and says, Lewis, thank you. I can't tell you how important that was for me. It was it it really did pull me out of the the problem I was in and I, I can't tell and Here's what I used to say when people would, ah, listen, don't think anything of it. No big deal. I right. would have done, you know, it's part of the job. Would have yeah, done it yeah. for anybody. It, you've just slapped the rule of reciprocity <laughs> out the window where it dominates that situation. You really did go out of your way. You really did go above and beyond and you've diminished it. Mm. So here's what I recommend that you say. Right. You say, of course, I was glad to do it. It's what partners do for one another. Ooh. Don't forget the addendum for one another. Oh, That's this... the mistake that people very much often. Ooh. You, you have to put it on the map. You have to acknowledge it. You don't diminish it. You don't dismiss it. You know, you put it on the map and you say, it's what we do for one another. That, that person that little... <laughs> is on record, is ready to give back to you. Wow. Now, that's for somebody that you've had a relation. It's what friends do. It's what partners do for one another, a business yes. part. What if it's somebody who, who you've helped for the first time? You don't have a lasting yes. relationship. What do you say then? Here's what I would recommend. Again, I was glad to do it. I know that if the situation were ever to be reversed, you do the same for me. Yeah. You do the same for me. <laughs> yeah. Again, you've put it up, you've put the person on record. Yes, yeah, I did do you a favor. And I know you're the kind of person who plays by the rules. The key is not to say, oh, I know if the situation had been reversed, you would have done the same for me. That's in the past. That will never happen. Mm. You say, if the situation would be reversed, you would do the same for me. You're going to get the next request wow. you ask for. Wow. The, subtle, the subtleties of how we communicate are so important in 
creating the life of our dreams and struggling consistently. I think the little nuances, you know, Chris Voss, who I think you know as well, I do. talks about this in his work, uh, Never Split the Difference. Just the little subtle communication, um, you know, the way we communicate, uh, the words we use at the specific time can drastically transform our life for right. good or not for good. Right. And I, and I think um, we, we want to learn how to use these tools, the communication styles ethically and in an empowering way so that everyone benefits. There's a win, win, win in every interaction. That's what I think what we're all looking for. That's what gets you long-term mm-hmm. rela- profitable relationships. People who are who who are with you, who, who trust you, who recognize that hey, you're a straight shooter. I can I can work with this person on into the future and do well. Yeah, I would see my father do this. My dad was in the uh, insurance business for I don't know, 33 years, and I would see him always going to the local shop. We were in a small town in Delaware, Ohio. So it was a very small community and and I would always see him, you know, buying from all the local people and then them buying from him and just like building those relationships. He would send them, you know, gifts. This was like snail mail days where he would like write them letters and he would find newspaper clippings about them and write a little thoughtful note and send it to them just kind of constantly in that giving mentality. And, um, I saw it work for him, you know, for, for decades in the insurance business of the kind of the old school pre-internet social media days. And, uh, and you can do it online, offline. And this, this, this law, this principle works. You know, I have a colleague. She's my uh, speaker's agent in Europe. And she has a, a client, very big client, but who's a slow pay. He doesn't pay for six months mm. right? and all her friends in the business say oh this guy you know his he's a big client we need him but he 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 won't pay our invoices and uh she asked me about it i said well what do you know about him she said well he lives in a different city than i do so i don't know a lot i just know that he's a he's a uh uh an art lover i said oh listen go to your local art galleries and museums where they have these little postcards, you know, that show the pictures of the the, the exhibitions that they have on display and their permanent uh, work and so on, and put one in the mail with your invoice. <laughs> I love that. Yes. She said, it cut time in half. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. If you want to get paid, you got to do, do things a little differently. You got to stand out. I think put, that's fascinating. Look, uh, put a put a Starbucks card in with the invoice. Mm-hmm. Something it could be twenty five bucks. It doesn't yeah. have to be. Yeah. Thank you for your business. Yeah. And now they're ready to say. Now they're the ones who are saying thank you, and no. they do it by st- things like that. Absolutely. Yeah. I love this. Um, anything else about reciprocation before we yeah, move we on? I think to we've covered our bases okay. there. <laughs> I love it. I think it's such an important rule, and it's um, yeah, and it's it's something that if you're not thinking of this, if you're not coming, in, in my opinion, if you're not coming from a giving heart first, right. and wanting to add value, wanting to be of service, wanting to give, it's just going to be harder to sustain relationships long term with your business, your intimate relationships, your family relationships, if you're always being the moocher or the taker. Right. And so I it's just come from a place of service first, and I think you'll always win out in the win-win-win situation in the long run. We are on the same page there. Yes. You come yes. from a, a, a position of service. What can That's you it. provide that enhances the other person's outcomes first? And then as a side effect, mm-hmm. they will want to enhance yours. Absolutely. The, the next principle is commitment and consistency. And I get this question so often, Robert, about people asking me about, you know, how have you built your online business or how have you got your podcast to go so big? What's the secret? What's the hack? What's the trick to help me launch my podcast as fast as you did? And I literally tell people commitment and consistency. Over, I'm like, I'm going to give you the most boring answer of how I've built, you know, one of the biggest shows, uh, podcasts in the world, yeah. which has been eight and a half years showing up every single week, being extremely committed to my vision, my mission of serving people and being so consistent 
never missing a week for eight and a half years. And when you do things consistently with a level of commitment to your vision, it starts to pay off. So can you explain more about commitment and consistency? I mean, that is very, that is primal what you just said. You have to have within yourself a commitment to your vision and a consistent uh, movement toward it in ways that really do uh, advance the, uh, toward your goals. Uh, but we also need to recognize that the people we want to influence also value consistency in themselves, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So one thing we can do is to find an existing value or an existing preference of theirs and show how what we offer them is consistent with that value, their vision, their commitment. Mm -hmm. And then they will want to move in our direction because of a drive to be congruent with their existing preferences uh, and, and, and values and, and previous choices. Right. Can you give an example around that? Here's one that... Uh, there was a study done in... Um, Chicago uh, restaurant owner, not this time a server, but a restaurant owner uh, who was having a problem with no-shows, people who weren't being consistent. They would call, they would make a, they would make a, a, a reservation, and then they wouldn't appear for it. And he went and he listened to what his receptionist would say when she took a booking, and she would say, thank you for calling Gordon's Restaurant. Please call if you have to change or cancel your reservation. Ah. Right? Right? He asked her to change two words. You were saying a minute ago, you know, it's remarkable how just changing a word or two, you know, it makes a big difference. He asked her to change two words. Instead of saying, please call, he asked her to say, will you please call if you have to change or cancel your reservation? And then he asked her to pause. If I said to you, will you please call? And I paused, what would you fill that pause with? You'd say, of course. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So it's you've them reciprocating a, and saying, yes, yes, I will. A commitment. You've made a commitment. Interesting. No shows dropped by 67%. This is crazy. Because people were on record as publicly committing themselves committing. to that act. Because we all want to be, I mean, it's a value to, to live up to what we say. We yeah. prefer our, that image our word. of ourselves. To be our word, yeah. Yes. And so you make people, uh, make that commitment explicit. Yes, I will. Now so, you've given yes. them something to be consistent with. Because please call is more of an ask. It's not. It's more right. of like a suggestion. Yeah. It's not a an ask with a commitment right. attached to it. The well, most brilliant thing about his recommendation was asking her to pause. So people had to make an active commitment. Oh, man, yeah. That's brilliant. Here's another one. I love this one. <laughs> Guy called me a couple of years ago. He's the Boy Scout. A leader and he says to make money for our troop we've arranged with a supermarket that we put uh tables outside the doors and we sell popcorn to people who come out of the supermarket uh to help the boy scouts right and he said our our, our results are dismal we're getting like 15 percent well i can understand why because first of all <laughs> People, if they wanted popcorn, they would have <laughs> bought it in the in the, and they've already expended their budget, right? And and they're tired and they're okay. So I said, so what do you say when they come? They said, would you like to buy some popcorn? If you do, you could support the Boy Scouts. I said, try this. Say, excuse me, do you support the Boy Scouts? Everybody says yes. Yes. If you and say, then no, I said, don't support the Boy Scouts. Right. Yeah, who, you're like a bad person. Who doesn't have as a value or the, the yeah. Boy Scout, right? A, a preference. He says, well, if you, if you would, if you do, would you like to buy some popcorn that will support us? Now 55%. The oh, you my go goodness. from 15 to 55 and here's what he said to me he called me up when, uh, he said this is amazing because the people 
who don't want the popcorn say i don't want your popcorn <laughs> but i'll give you a donation because i support the boy scouts amazing so they're making <laughs> they're making a profit without even having to sell the popcorn it's amazing because they get people to first make a commitment where how do you ask the question so people say yes to the direction you would like them to move before you ask them to move in that yeah. direction yes yeah. i'm i'm reminded of i'm having so many flashbacks of early 2010s where i studied your your book uh, and i was studying everyone else in kind of uh behavioral psychology and influence and persuasion and marketing and i'm reminded of um oh my gosh is it Frank Lutz? Frank Lutz? Lutz. Lutz, yes. Words that work. Yep. Where he had all these examples kind of similar to what you created where it's like, if you just change this one word, all these other things could happen in your favor. And it's so fascinating that you're giving these suggestions and testing these things for the Boy Scouts and all these people. Um, and it's seeing these increases just with a couple little right. tweaks. And if we learn these things, and you, I know you've got all this stuff in your book as well, but if we start to really learn these yeah. things, it's just the result can be incredible. For a return on, on investment that's over the top, the, the investment is one more breath? That's it. <laughs> Will you? Yeah. you know? With a pause, yes. And a pause. <laughs> it's costless. Mm-hmm. So when I, so I don't know how many of uh, the people who who listen are managers or have to run teams from time to time, where you have a team meeting, and everybody has a task to do before the next meeting. Here's what I say: I, Don't let anybody out of that room until you say, "Will you be able to complete that task?" Ooh. by our next so when so we do our team calls on mondays and if we have kind of each person go around and share like what's the one thing they're going to accomplish this week or the big task of the week yeah. how should we phrase that yeah. to get their buy-in and their commitment right. on, on if, that what you say to them is will do you think you will be able to accomplish this or make progress toward it before our next meeting and if they say no, I don't, it, you know, you can say, well, what can you get some help with it? Do you need more resources? Do you need to put something else to the side? You can then work on getting to yes, right? Right. But if they do say, yes, I'm able, you have now motivated them to put that higher in the priority list mm -hmm. of what they're going to do because they've made a commitment. Yes. They've made a public commitment to everybody that they're going to do it. And no one wants to break their commitment. No one wants to break their word. If you do it over and over again, you kind of lose confidence in yourself. You know, your your self-worth goes down. Your, I guess your likability with yourself kind of probably goes down because you're always breaking your commitment to yourself and other you know, people, right? That's a really good point. And a lot of people, when we talk about this, say, oh, well, your reputation with others will mm. go down if you break it. What you've pointed to is something just as powerful. You want to live up to your own standards. Mm -hmm. And so you will take steps to make sure you you live up to your commitments. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what's one thing, if I'm trying to get someone to listen more regularly on the show or watch the YouTube channel on a weekly basis. What's something I could ask to the listeners or the viewers to get them committed to showing up consistently? What would be something you'd suggest? Or for anyone who has a show that's, you know, has that they want to get their listeners to be more consistent, what would you suggest? I would say I'd, I'd begin by asking for something small. Like, could you listen to last week's podcast or any of the following mm -hmm. and tell me and then say to yourself was that worth it mm. and would you like to get that kind of benefit regularly i'm going to make a commitment to you if you do you will get that 
I'm going to, I, I select my guests and I do my homework so that there is value for you in each of our programs. And if you would be willing to make that commitment to me, I have made, I'll make this commitment to wow. you. You will get value. I love yeah. that. Okay. Awesome. Anything else around commitment or consistency that we should know about? Okay. Here's another thing where you change one word. Yes. Um, so again, let's say you're a manager and you've got a, a goal that your team is making progress toward and, and they're advancing and, and they're halfway there. And what we're always supposed to do is to congratulate them on uh, the, the movement that they've made and on their progress. That's a mistake. Mm. to use the word progress, to congratulate people on their progress. Because what you've asked them to do is look behind them at where they have been and what, what's happened so far and their, their movement. Mm. And a lot of times people say, oh, okay. They're, satis they're satisfied. They're I'm okay. satisfied. Now yeah. I can coast a little bit here, mm. right? If instead you don't say congratulations on your progress that you've made toward the goal. It's congratulations on your commitment to this goal. To finishing this. <laughs> now they're looking forward. Wow. And the research shows they're significantly more likely to reach that goal on time. Mm. If you use the word commitment to it, than progress Ooh. toward it. Congratulations on your commitment to this goal. So not even, don't even add congratulations on the progress of your commitment to this goal. Just say congratulations on the commitment to on your the goal. Commitment. We're, we're doing great things, and we're, we're, we're almost there. Let's finish it off. Right. Okay, congratulations on the commitment. I'm writing this down. I like that a lot. Um, my your commitment. Make sure it's their commitment. Your and commitment your, to this goal. Okay. Yeah. I hope everyone's taking notes as well, like me. Um, <laughs> I love this. This is powerful. Me too. I love Commit this stuff. Commitment and consistency. I always love this stuff. <laughs> you know, this, I was always a curious uh, teenager and young man about it. How did this work like that? Mm -hmm. How did people get me to say yes to things I wasn't really interested in? You know? I didn't want to buy it, this. Yeah. yeah, I didn't want this thing. It must be the way they presented it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the psychology of it. Yeah. Yes, yes. The next principle is social proof, and I've always been fascinated by this. I think there's uh, there's stories in the book that that go into some of these examples, but I'm always fascinated by the one of just like, okay, there's two coffee shops or two donut shops or whatever. There's the same type of store. One's got a long line, and the other has no line, and then most people go into the one with the long line because it just shows a social proof case study of people want this thing then it must be good can you explain right. more of this concept of social proof well yes and i want to um, compliment you on that particular example because not only does it show the principle of social proof that says when i'm uncertain about what to do i use the responses of other people the choices of other people to steer me mm -hmm. in that direction it reduces my uncertainty we're so persuaded but to, to want to wait in line just because everyone else wants the thing it's like the nightclub where it's like they right. make you wait outside in line yeah you want to go in there you know <laughs> exactly so that's the uh, that's the extra point that i think you raise with that example you're willing to go and wait in line and incur all the inconvenience because this rule is so powerful crazy you'll wait yeah. 10 20 30 minutes for the same cup of coffee right you know, or whatever it is you know it's like it, it, a lot of times i mean i haven't been in a nightclub in i don't know 10 years or something but a lot of times you would go into the nightclub and you're like oh, this is not that good let me get out of here you just <laughs> waited an hour to go something you didn't really like um one of, here's a story that for me, that this worked incredibly well when I learned this principle in 2009. I learned this from you, and it worked. I was like, this is fascinating. I remember getting a big press opportunity. I was in a big 
I don't know, five-page spread of Details Magazine. The magazine's no longer around, I don't think, but Details Magazine. I remember it. It was a big magazine back in the day. It was kind of like a GQ type of thing. And I got an email from one of the main writers there saying, I'm doing a story about um, online marketers who can help you earn more money. And I've got Tim Ferriss that I'm featuring, Gary Vaynerchuk, Seth Godin, and I want to include you. And it was maybe one or two other people. And he was like, we're going to fly you out to New York City. We're going to do a big photo shoot, the whole thing. I was a nobody, Robert. I was a nobody. No one even knew who I was. I had a very small following when I was teaching LinkedIn strategies back in 2008. So I had a small micro community. and But I was nobody compared to Tim Ferriss and Gary Vaynerchuk and all these other people. And I said yes right away. And I, I went there and did this shoot. And it was like this big spread in details magazine and it was like a massive opportunity for me and i remember after it was published i asked the writer <laughs> i didn't want to ask him beforehand but i asked the writer hey why did you choose me why did you want to have me in this this featured magazine and he said i saw someone retweet one of your tweets and i went to who was influential to me, I saw them retweet it. Then I went to your link in your bio and I saw your website. And on the website, at the very top, I saw that you were featured in Time Magazine and, and Fast Company and a few other places. And he said, right away, I saw that you were featured in these other places and I thought if you were good enough for them, you were good enough for Details Magazine. And that was pretty much all the research he did before reaching out to me. And there was two levels of wow. social proof. One, someone sharing uh, a message that I had put out there on Twitter that he right. saw. So someone else was talking about it. And right. then seeing the the logos of the other press that I had gotten, which was very small you know, mentions. It wasn't like these featured articles, but it was showing where I'd been featured. And he said, because other people desired you and wanted to talk about you, right. I figured you were good enough for us. Yep. And that, that small change oh, that I learned man. from you helped just unlock so much more. And I think if people just understood the subtleties of just showcase where you've been featured, just make sure you're showing these things so people are aware, it'll bring new opportunities. Right. And, uh, I mean, that's, um, that's the, the essence of social proof. Yes. What are people around me like me? doing or what have they been doing that reduces my uncertainty about what i should do in that situation um and uh, it, it works in all kinds I, there is this uh, uh lovely little study in a uh, a pub in uh in uk in london where one day the uh, proprietor put up a sign on the bar that said this week our most popular Beer is our porter, right? Porter sales doubled. Just by saying this week our most popular is. Wow. We all have our most popular item, yes. product, feature, payment plan. All we have to do is point to, to the one that is, mm -hmm. and people say, oh, I can stop asking about where I should go or what I should... No, here's a reason for me to stop searching and choose right now. Right? Well, I, I feel like we're all suckers for this. I mean, not in a bad way, but when I go to a restaurant that I've never been to, I just ask the waiter... I don't even look at the menu. I just say, what are the three most popular items or what are the three things you like the most on the menu? And they'll say, well, this one's great. I love this one the most and this is the most popular one. And then I make a decision based on that typically because I don't want to look through everything and try to find something. I yeah. just want to know what do other people like? What do you like? And what's the recommendation? Right. And, you know, I'm sure on Amazon, I'm, they're probably the masters at all of this, but um, they're showing Amazon's recommended choice all the time when you search into something. I, right. buy, I buy that recommended choice pretty much every time. It's got the most reviews. It's got the credibility. It's got all these things. You know, um, I do the same thing when I go to a restaurant where I am not familiar with yeah. the menu. I just add one other thing that uh, I, when I say, so tell me, what are your most popular items in the 
ad, uh, appetizer category. How about the mains? How about the desserts? Yes. And so on, whatever I'm interested in, soup, whatever. And I say, of your regulars, tell me the people who are your regulars. What's the most popular of theirs? Mm. They're essentially the verified buyers right. on Amazon. On Amazon, right? yes. Yeah, that we all listen to the most, right? Your regulars, they've already done the beta testing for me. I don't have to go all over the menu and mm -hmm. test. So what's the, so that's a, that idea, uh, I mean... I wonder if... I've never seen a menu do that in each category. I've seen sometimes like one item that says like our most popular item, but I wonder if they did it in appetizers, salads, soups, you know, entrees, desserts. They put the top, like the star, most popular item here in each category. I bet those things would get so much more sales. Louis, I can give you confirmation <laughs> okay, that you're great. right. There was a study done in Beijing shows you how cross-culturally wow. extended this principle is. Restaurant managers put a little asterisk next oh. to certain items in each of the categories, and each one became 13 to 20% more purchased. And what did the asterisk stand for? This is one of our most popular items. I bet you could start to predict, as a business owner, a restauranteur, what ingredients you need more of based on the consistency of just that one difference of putting an asterisk or most popular or whatever you want to do it, you can start to predict the sales every week of, okay, I'm not going to buy an excess of all these other ingredients because we know that only 20% of people are going to buy these other lower choices. You can start to increase the profit margin. You can start to predict things better. Uh, there's so many things that would happen in your benefit. Well, here's the best part of it. And I bet people are happier because they're making a choice they think is the best choice. Right. And they enjoy it more psychologically. They're like, oh, I'm doing what everyone else loves. That's the best part because not only are you reducing their uncertainty, if you've truly pointed to the genuinely most popular, you're giving them a better experience. Exactly. And they're going to come back. They're going to come back. And also, you're going to become better at making that thing better. Mm -hmm. Because you're working on that thing more, you're going to make sure it's great every time. Like, just it's just all these things are going to level you up the entire experience. I love this, and it, it doesn't have to be any one thing. It can be a couple of things yes. within the advertise uh, the appetizer category and Absolutely. so on. Yeah. Top two most popular choices. Yeah. Yes. Anything else around social proof that we should be aware of? No, I think this is well. The the biggest is it shouldn't just be many others it should be comparable others we most reduce our uncertainty of what to do in a situation by looking at what those like us have done there interesting right? so one thing we can do is uh, let people know that you know like on the the uh, hotel sites what they will do is segment their market and say the best hotels as rated by uh, business people, the best for uh, mm. leisure travelers, the best for romantic couples, the best for people with families. And so now you dive right in there and you say, that's, that's where I'm going to go to get that's my smart. information. That's mm -hmm. smart. Yeah. Specializing it to people that are like you or doing right. something like you. I love that. And uh, speaking of li liking someone, uh, the next principle is is liking, and what is the difference between liking and likability? Well, you can become you you get liking by being likable. Okay, but nobody would be surprised to hear that. Here's what's worth knowing from the research, and that is there are two very small things we can do that cause people to like us more. One is to point to similarities between the two of us, right? The comparabilities. Uh, and uh, because people like those who are like them. Yes. Right? There was a study of negotiators who were doing bargaining over email. And if before they began to, to bargain, they traded information about one another... Right, so they could personalize the other person, you know. They found that 
stymied negotiations went from 30% to 6%. Wow. Just by sending... Now, here's the key. When the researchers looked at the data, they found that it wasn't those who sent the most information back and forth about themselves and, you know, kind of made themselves human. It was whether in the information there were parallels. The similarities. You're a runner. I'm a runner. Yes. You're an only child. I'm an only child. Those were the things that created the willingness to give the other person grace mm -hmm. in a negotiation so you don't walk away with a stymied, deadlocked, mm. nothing burger where nobody wins. <laughs> right, right. So that that's the first thing, having shared similarities right. within, within each other. What's the second thing? Praise compliments wow i'm gonna admit to something here <laughs> this is my biggest fallback this is this is my biggest mistake i have a very difficult time giving warranted praise really to people why is that it was the way i grew up oh. my parents didn't do it they were always they didn't say, I loved you. They would yeah. say, well, they would say that, but they wouldn't say, oh, great job on that, in, in that game, or you really, you know, did terrific. Because they didn't want me to take it easy. Mm -hmm. They always wanted me to... Push to a be, little harder, yeah. Push a little harder. <laughs> so, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I was a, before I retired, a research psychologist, and I, how many times in meetings, research meetings with my graduate students, I would hear myself say, oh, that's a brilliant thing that Lewis just said. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, what Sarah, how Sarah just phrased that is exactly what we should say in our study. But you want to say And it. I say it to myself. <laughs> yeah. and I didn't. And I missed all the goodwill wow. that would come from just translating it from my mind to my tongue. And now I I don't do that anymore. I make sure that anytime I hear myself praise somebody, in my head, I hear myself say it in my ears because I mm, say it out loud. That's good, yeah. I can't tell you the effect it's had on, uh, on the social interaction and goodwill in those sessions and with my students. You know, it's fascinating. Again, I have applied so many of these principles throughout my the last 10, 12 years, I guess. When I was getting started, a lot of people are listening. They've been following for a while. They know my story. I got started using LinkedIn to kind of build relationships and connections. And then from there, started helping people how to use LinkedIn to get opportunities and jobs and, you know, investors and all these different things. And the first few months of using LinkedIn back in 2007, 2000, yeah, late 2007, I would email people and message people and, and very few would reply to me. And I was reaching out to kind of influential CEOs and business leaders because I was trying to build relationships. I was trying to interview them early on to ask them questions and just learn from them. And very few would give me the time of day. And then I started to implement this strategy from your book of, of, of liking, right? And, and also kind of social proof in there as well. And I started emailing and I said to myself, in the first sentence, I've got to incorporate this. So I would look and do research on their profile and I'd see what are the similarities? How do we know, how do we know each other? How do we know friends of friends? That's why I think social networking is a great tool to use because you can usually see if you have common friends. And <clears throat> I would... I would always talk about like, oh, I see that we have Bob and Sarah and Tom as mutual friends. There's a, there's a similarity. I would see where did they go to school? Where are they from? Did they play sports? Because it tells you their hobbies, their interests, their associations. You know, I see that you're a public speaker. I'm in Toastmasters right now. I see that you played football. I just finished playing arena football. Whatever it is, I would try to add three levels of similarities within the first sentence. And by doing that, I believe I think I got like eight or nine out of 10 replies every time, whereas maybe I was only getting 
one or two out of ten yeah. replies before yeah. then. Yeah. Just by adding that wow. and also wow. by acknowledging yeah. something in their career they did that I felt inspired by. So I would add oh, the similarities and then I would also try to find out praise. what did they do in their career. I would research them a lot and say, I really like when you put this out. I really like how you did this thing. And I acknowledge them for that. And then I would say, I would love to learn more about how you did this. Before, I would say, can you give me advice? Can I take 10 minutes of your time yeah, where you yeah. teach me these things? Yeah. Then I said, no one wants to give advice and, right. and give up when they're busy and give them their time. Right. Yeah. But people love to tell the story of their success and how they overcame the challenge. So I rephrased it and I would get uh -huh. so many different connections from that. Because I didn't ask for advice. I just was inspired by their story and wanted them to share. And by listening, they gave me all the advice in the world. You know, it seems to me you've hit the two principal pillars of liking then. You, similarity and praise. Uh, and, and uh, yeah. So, not only do we like the people who are like us, we like the people who do like us and say so. Praise, compliments. We like the people who give us compliments. And as a result, we want to do business with them. We want to interact with them. We want to say yes to them. Yeah. Praise. It's such a simple thing. And it's, and it's again, it's costless. Yes. I mean, but what you did is the right thing. It, if you give a phony compliment, you know, it, it's just going to ring. It's not yeah, going to ring true. Weird. Yeah. But... If you really research them, really think about who they are and understand what their challenges are, who, where they came from, what challenges they've overcome, and you praise that, it's genuine. It rings true. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love this. Liking is huge. Again, two things that we can do to get more people to like us is finding commonalities and similarities and praise, acknowledgement, compliments. They're, they're free. It just takes a little bit of research, a little bit of thoughtfulness, and the benefits are abundant. And uh, it doesn't take a lot of research because no. they tell us about themselves on LinkedIn. Exactly. Right? They just tell us about themselves on Facebook. Google it's not them. proprietary information. You can go to someone's Instagram and in a few photos, you yeah. can see if they have kids, you can see what they're up to, where they live. And they want us to know that exactly. about them. <laughs> exactly. And it's interesting when I'm sure, Bob, when you get emailed um, and someone does the research and someone shares common similarities and they acknowledge you for the incredible work you've done in the world and how your book has impacted them or the videos they've seen, you're more likely to reply. Maybe you won't spend your time on the phone with them, but you're more likely to say, I like this person. Let me at least say thank you and I appreciate it. And let's, you know, maybe in the future we'll get together. I feel obligated to want to reply to those nice compliments and oh we, we know these people in common oh, okay if i don't reply to this person and he has a common friend am i going to be the jerk that blows you know is it going right. to come back to me from my friend that i was a jerk you know it's like yeah. we feel obligated i i am exactly the same somebody compliments me it's very difficult to just dismiss them <laughs> and not you have to do something in return say thank you it's you know, reciprocity like you have to do something in return I love it. Um, okay, the next principle is authority. And I think um, with all the people that are maybe getting started in their career or their business or they're launching an idea and they feel like they have no authority, why do they need to create authority um, in order to be more successful? How do they gain authority in an authentic way? And, and what happens if we don't have authority? Yeah. So I'm going to differentiate between two kinds of authority, both of which make a difference and cause people to say yes to us. But the person you described doesn't have the first type, which is to be in a position of authority. That is, uh, to, be, uh, to have standing or stature in a hierarchy or something. Uh, yeah. There, so there are people who are in authority, that's not who we're talking about in influence, that's power, that's about power. There are people, there's somebody who is an authority, that's the person I'm talking about, somebody who's knowledgeable, 
somebody who has experience, somebody who can point to some credentials they have. And very often, you know, that can be somebody who's just come out of a training program or a university with a, a major on, in a particular area where they specialize and they can say, I know about the latest research on this, you know, uh, or somebody who's uh, been around for a while can say, I've been in this area for a while and I have a lot of experience. You can point to those things that are genuine uh, credentials that you have and you uh, so, for example, I did a, a some work with a hospital in the. I live in the Phoenix area. It's a, a hospital where they asked me to help them with uh, stroke patients who weren't doing their home exercises that the physical therapist gave them to do when they left the hospital, and so they weren't getting better. Um, so I said, well, can you show me what you do? And, and they said, well, here's the, the, the regimen we give them to do it. And we take them into this, this little room and we make sure they understand everything. And I looked at the room. There were pictures on the walls. I said, replace those pictures with your credentials. Put your diplomas put your awards, put your certifications on the wall. And exercise compliance as measured by uh, flexibility, strength, range of motion increased by 31% because in the room where they were giving them the information, they had all this inf all this evidence the credibility, that they yeah. were an authority so people took them more seriously. Yes. Yeah. So, so showca showcasing your credentials. Showcase your credentials. You can't do it face to face, though. You can't sit down in front of somebody and say, Louis, let me just tell you how great I yeah. really am. Yeah, yeah. Right? No, you do it by sending them uh, your resume as an attachment ahead of your first meeting. I'm looking forward to our meeting on Thursday uh, The top on the topic of X. Here are my background and credentials on X. Right. Or you right. say, here's my LinkedIn right. profile. Absolutely. Here's, go there. Or at the bottom of your email signature, you could have like the letters, or the initials. The, the initials, I'm yes. sure that if I, you know, if I'm looking at your book here and it just said Robert Cialdini with no PhD after it, versus having the PhD, I'm sure that adds just a subtle level of credibility with this right here. It does. For people. And the authority. Now, the if authority, you hold yeah. that up again and you look at the top of it, mm -hmm. over 5 million oh, yeah. copies sold, yes. that's social proof. Huge social proof. But in both cases, I'm pointing to something that's genuine. Right. I don't have to fabricate it. I don't have to really... You Plus, don't have to do that. Yeah, you have the social proof with how many this is how many people have bought it. Then you have the more social proof from a credible source giving a recommendation. Then you have uh, this down here, which is the authority. It's all on the front of the book. New and expanded, you know, additional content, all this stuff. It's all on the front page, which helps you make a decision. And you know, Lewis, I had in the past. Not this particular edition, but in previous editions. I've had to fight my publisher to get that stuff on there. Really? Because they said, you know, we want more white space. What? You right. want white space? <laughs> I'm talking yeah. about authority. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. about social. You need this. You're yeah. talking about white space? <laughs> yeah. And you have, again, praise on the back. It's like when someone's praising you, it's more social proof. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because there's so many authors who have implemented these strategies over the last 10 years since you've been putting this work out there and, and you see it everywhere now you see everyone following a similar format if they're researched and studied well with these right. principles and it's they work they yep. do it because it works um because it, it works so authority yeah okay. and oh there's one more f feature of authority that the newest research suggests um and that is people say how do i how can i multiply my authority well get legitimate experts quotes or testimonials 
doesn't have to be necessarily to you or your product, but to your idea. Yes. To, the, to the, you as a the person. Thing, to you as, yes. And, all right, you put that there in, in any message that you send at the top. Not at the, don't bar, you want that authority aura to f- suffuse everything that goes next. Every claim that you make really you want to be supported by the fact that an authority agrees with you and your vision so what, what would this be would this be for like a book proposal to have those at the top would it be for what other types of examples would that be for to put the quotes at the top at your website at the top at the web your, the website is the key right what's the first thing you should see on somebody's website you should see testimonials mm-hmm. from credible people. From yeah. Credible people. Most of the the websites have them buried somewhere mm-hmm. or in a separate category over there. Praise for such a it. There should be testimonials at the outset so that that authority um, influence applies to everything. You've yet to read mm. in it. Yes, it sets the it sets the tone, right? As opposed to them guessing and wondering and have to look, it sets the stage of this is the authority. This is a credible person. Let me learn more. Not right. Let me find out if they're credible with their bio and this and this or whatever. Like scrolling. Like start with credibility and authority. That's why when I they use the strategy of like, here are the other places I've featured. Here are the logos of the presses that I've been featured on. It was instant authority. Just when a second you see it, you feel authority in your body. You're just like, okay, as opposed to not showing it at the top, people have to go down and look for it. I feel like you're missing the mark. I once did some uh, work with Bose Acoustics Corporation. They had a new product, the Bose Wave mu- music system at the time. And uh, after we... Uh, got some increased uh, sales to a particular ad, uh, the the product had been out there long enough that they had authorities uh, testifying. And so they made up a, a new generation of the ad with the authorities in there, right? Except they were at the bottom of the ad, mm. the authority. And we just had them move them to the top and got a 15% increase in sales. Crazy. You see that, I think the movie industry does as well, where they are constantly saying, the movie of the year by Entertainment Magazine, or this, you know, it's like astonishing, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, you see that always flashing up in the trailers of, of the movies, and you just like, okay, if everyone else loves this, and they're calling them the authority, or this is the authoritative movie of the year, I got to right. go watch it, you know? Right, right. Right. 20 Emmy nominations. It's like, okay, right. I have to go watch this. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it's the authority in that space as well. So, Remember I said that social proof reduces your uncertainty about what you, sh- what you should do. The same thing applies to authority. If the experts are recommending something, it reduces your uncertainty. You don't have to sit on the fence anymore. You don't have to ditter around and think about this or that. Boom. You can go right in. I love it. I love that. We've got uh, the the final principle of the previous version until you've discovered the new principle, which I want to get to. But the, 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 the original final principle is scarcity. And can you explain the, the principle of scarcity, why we find things that are rare and scarce or limited, something that we desire, that we want uh, on human psychology standpoint? And then also... In a digital world, for people that have an unlimited of digital goods, essentially, that's not a physical good, yeah. and they, they have digital, how do they position in a way that is ethical scarcity? Okay, I want to take those in order, because yes. that's the right uh, sequence of this. First of all, the reason we want uh, things that are rare, or scarce, or dwindling in availability is that Otherwise, we lose them. Mm. And loss is a more powerful motivator yeah. in human psychology <laughs> than gaining the same thing. 
Really? There's a, a man who won the Nobel Prize in economics a few years ago, Daniel Kahneman, for something he called prospect theory, where he showed that the prospects of gaining a particular uh, amount of a resource, right? let's say a dollar, right? compared to the prospects of losing that mm. dollar, people were twice as likely to want to avoid losing the dollar wow. than gaining the extra one. Right. So, we're, wow. So, if, the, if if we have um, the ability to earn, uh, gain a million dollars or lose a million dollars, we'd rather hold on to the losing of the million dollars than the possibility of gaining. Is that kind of that's the same a, cut? I, I, I once gave a lecture to a financial services firm, and afterwards, the, the, the boss came up to me and said, you just said something with that loss aversion, the idea of people are averse to loss more than uh, they, they want to gain things. You just said something that finally allows me to understand what my mentor told me. He said, if you have a high value uh, client, right, way up there. You don't the, want to lose them. You Right, yeah, but they're millions of dollars, yes. right? And you call them, at five in the morning and say, if you act now, you'll be able to gain $25,000 on, uh, uh, on this stock. They're going to scream at you and hang up the phone. But if you call them and say, if you, if you act now, you'll avoid losing $25,000 on our position, they'll thank you. Wow. People don't want to lose what they have. They don't want to lose. So that's why scarcity is so valuable because scarcity, loss is the ultimate form of scarcity. It means you can't have it anymore. That's why people are so adamant about grabbing onto scarce or dwindling resources. They don't want to lose them. Okay, now, how does that apply? How do you do that when you've got a, a lot of various, a, a lot of opportunities? Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to uh, two things. One is you do have something that's scarce, which is what differentiates you from your rivals? What is the single thing that people can't get? They will lose if they don't move in your direction, right? Now, it might not be one thing, but it might be a suite of things, a combination of items that only you provide. Right. Right? And then you simply say, you you don't just say, and if you will go with us, you will gain these. Mm. You have to be able to really? say, you don't want to lose these benefits mm. that only we can offer. You don't want to miss that. Mm -hmm. right? Remember I told you about the Bose ad yes. that we did where if you added testimonials at the top, you increased uh, uh, sales by 15%. And I said, but first of all, we had done something that increased their sales in a different way. Well, here's what we did. At the top of their initial ad for the Bose Wave Musis music system, they had new uh, features, new convenience, new simplicity, new elegance, right? And at the top was the word new. This was their ad. We changed it to, hear what you've been missing. Ooh. And we got a 45% increase in sales. <laughs> so something people have lost, missing, you haven't, before, you haven't heard it yet. Yeah. Yes, before all those new features, and uh, those were things to be gained. Now we say you don't want to miss these. Yeah, that's good. That's interesting, man. Human that's why scarce. Okay, so that's one thing. Yeah. Now here's the other, and I think your online people will be interested in it. There was a study of six thousand seven hundred online commercial sites, mm -hmm. right? And they looked at A/B tests within each one yep. for various kinds of features of the site that would lead to conversions. Right? 
and some of them were economic, like uh, do we offer free delivery, right? Uh, some were uh, technological. Are, is there a search function in the site for where you can go? Some were psychological, like uh, is there a, a call to action uh, it, it, after each appeal, you know, in each appeal? The top six were the six principles. It wasn't any of that. It was the six principles of influence. And you know what was at the top? Scarcity. Really? If you could legitimately say, we only have X number of these items at this price, yes. or with this feature, or with this bonus, you got the most conversions of all. Wow. Even more than saying we only have a limited time for really? buying this at this price. So limited time is valuable, but limited quantity or package of certain things is more powerful. And here's why. Because with a limited number... You can still You're wait in competition. Till, all right. But you, limited time, you can still wait till the last minute. Yeah. You're not in competition yes. with anybody yeah. for it. You can do it any time. Mm -hmm. If it's a limited number, you better move or it'll be gone. It's lost. Yes. Yeah. Now, if you've got a lot of these, you can say this, this special is only good for X number of items or... You know, we've only got so many of these with this extra feature or that we will provide this additional inducement. Now, let me say, that was number one. Number two was social proof. Mm. Telling people what a lot of others like them had been doing with this, right? Number three was limited time. Mm -hmm. And here's one. I rarely see in online um, sites. It was the liking principle. Really? Here's what they did. They began with a welcoming letter. Mm. I'm, I'm... It's what you do, like when somebody comes to your door, you welcome them in. Yes. You say, hello, glad that you're here. Yep. Come on in. It was a welcoming letter. Mm. Liking. First. Scarcity, social proof, limited time, liking with a welcome letter. This was the, this, the uh, in order, well, the influence. Well, factors. Actually, yeah. authority, was, authority was before liking. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Authority. I love this stuff. I love learning about this. Yeah, I don't know if people. Hopefully, people are jotting down as many notes as me. This is powerful. The scarcity thing has been a big factor that I've seen more and more in the last couple of years. Uh, with I don't know if you've been aware of this whole NFT movement. These NFTs online, which are essentially digital representations of artwork. Oh yes, um, I am. That that are selling out in seconds. You know, when they have a thousand or five hundred, they're limited. They're selling out in seconds. I live here in Los Angeles, and sometimes I'll drive down uh, Fairfax or Melrose Avenue, and you'll see people in hundreds of people in line outside of a store, the shoe stores, kind of the sneakerhead stores where they have like this limited run, and people will wait for hours. I think it's you know I think yeah, Apple does this well where it's like we've only got a limited amount the first week. You know, stand in line for three days in a tent so you can get the iPhone when it comes out. Right. The first, yeah. Uh, you know, baseball and basketball and trading cards have have become a booming in the last couple of years. I even got involved in this and I was like, I can't believe, uh, you know, we're now with so much limited quality, uh, a quantity of older cards or rare cards, I think it was two days ago, the uh, – Honus Wagner card sold for $6.6 .6 million as the new <laughs> highest price card ever sold when it was previously sold for, I think, $5.1 or something like a year ago. And it's a 
two inch by two inch piece of cardboard. Right. You know, it's selling for millions because it's rare. It's scarce. And I think you know, that's crazy. That is crazy. And here's the best example I ever saw. It has to do with Apple and how Apple uses this, right? So uh, it was the release of the iPhone 5. In Phoenix, uh, the local TV station that I listen to, I watch, uh, they sent a reporter to interview the people who had been around the corner in sleeping bags, right? waiting for this and and they went up uh, the the reporter went up to the person who was number 23 in line so and in, in interviewing so do you talk to the other people in line uh, did you get to know them she said yeah actually she said i was originally number 25 in line but i struck up a conversation with the woman who was number 23 who admired my shoulder blade it's a Two thousand eight hundred dollar Louis Vuitton bag. She did not Vuitton give it to her for the bag. spot, and she—that's exactly oh right. Oh my Lewis. goodness! She said, "I, I brokered a deal with her. Your spot in line for my Louis Vuitton bag." That's craziness. To go from twenty-five to twenty-three, and the, and to her credit, the the reporter, after stammering, "What?" She said, "Why did you do that?" And she said. I heard this shop didn't have a lot, and I didn't want to lose the chance to get one. Wow. It's all about loss. Scarcity is about loss. And you'll give up a $2,800 shoulder bag mm. to Crazy. go from 25 to 23? Yeah, maybe to That's like how number powerful one. this yeah. is. <laughs> That's and crazy, but... It, the human psychology is fascinating. The way our brain thinks, the way we work is fascinating. So scarcity is all about loss and showcasing that there's a limited quantity. You don't want to lose out. You don't want to miss out on this limited quantity or packaging, exclusive right. packaging of the thing. Right. Anything else on scarcity before we get into no, unity? That's, that's a good this is great. Uh, run through. So for... How long is this? The first book has been around for what? Over a, over a decade, right? Before yeah, the yeah. new before the new version came out, twelve years. Twelve years, and these six principles have been the leading force in massive companies for entrepreneurs, for lifestyle entrepreneurs, for online websites for for the last twelve years. But now with this new and expanded version, you've got a lot of new research. And you've added an additional principle, which is unity. Can you explain what unity is and why you decided to add an additional yeah. principle to influence? Because I started to see evidence that I was mistaken in thinking that unity was just an extension of similarity. What unity is, mm. if, if as a communicator, I can convince somebody that I share membership in a, in a we group, a group that this person uses the term we mm. to, to characterize, right? Everything becomes easier inside the boundaries of the we group. So, for example, like we are part of, uh, you know, the, the same college alumni association. Precisely. Some category mm -hmm. that defines God, so our smart. identity, right? And um, so I, even, yeah, so region is one thing. So, for example, people uh, who uh, belong to the same city or same community state. or to, state. Co country. It's like country. finding something where we're a part, we belong. Uh, we belong. We're a we group, wow. right? But it when when we were first talking before we went on the air, you were saying some of your followers just want to know about how things can be done um, in their personal life to increase their their uh, outcomes. And there's a great example of how the uh, unity principle works in relationships, romantic relationships. You know, in all romantic relationships, there are some things that are going really well, and there are some things that you, there are just a disagreement. You, you're not, 
you, you, you can't get resolution on a particular problem or difficulty. And so these researchers in Texas brought uh, couples into a, a, a situation, a research situation, and they said, what we'd like you to do is, is um, think about a, a, an issue that you haven't been able to get uh, agreement on. You just, all the time that you've been together, you just haven't been able to do it and we would like for one of you and flipped a coin uh, to be the persuader to try to persuade your partner to come into line with your position on this issue right and then they took a step back left the room but they had tv cameras and, and tape recorders going so they knew what happened and they found three kinds of persuaders one was what they called the uh coercive persuader who said I need you to do this for me otherwise you'll be sorry I'll have to do some things that you're not mm -hmm. uh, happy about right not only did that fail to work it produced polarization you that you got the opposite result now the recipient of that message was further away from the persuader's position so that was terrible there was another approach that the researchers called the ra the rational logical approach where the persuader said look if you'll just if if you'll just examine the situation more closely you'll see that my position <laughs> is the more rational one yes. it's the more reasonable one <laughs> now that didn't get polarization that got laughter yes <laughs> right right oh, yeah, you think you, so they they got no movement at all from that one there was only one strategy that worked what was that? By a very small percentage of people. <laughs> okay. Right, who said, you know, we've been together now for two and a half years. Mm. I'd really appreciate it if you'd do this for me. They just brought to the surface that they were a unit. Wow. They shared an identity. That's all. That was it. No new information, no greater logic, no, no, no. Just bring to consciousness that we are a we group. Wow. And inside we groups, people support and compromise. It's what we do inside we groups. Mm -hmm. right? Now, there was another version of that that was even simpler to Im implement it was simply to use the pronouns we our and us in making the request for so, change wow for change gotcha we our, our and us and us okay again bringing to consciousness the idea of oh we're members of this shared identity it can be anything really and it could be we go to the same gym we like the same workouts we like the same whatever food we like the same restaurants you're saying any type of we community yes so i i grew up in wisconsin yep and so my nfl football team is the green bay packers all my life i've been a packers fan right mm -hmm. A little uh, a while ago i read a newspaper article where they looked at the favorite NFL teams of various celebrities. And I found out that Justin Timberlake and Lil Wayne <laughs> are both avid Green Bay Packer fans. Uh -huh. Lewis, I immediately th thought better of their music. Oh, wow. That's crazy. <laughs> and I wanted them to succeed oh, my to goodness. a greater. They were of me. They weren't just like me. They were one of us. They were one of us. It made all, yeah. So that's crazy. And I'm and I'm assuming the more uh, emotionally connected to an identity group you are, the more likely you're want to support or be in partnership with or right. like someone who is a part of that deeper emotional group for you if you're like the green bay packers super fan if you right. find one person likes them you're like okay i look at them completely differently now completely differently that's amazing so how yeah. how can we incorporate this in okay. a business negotiation let's say 
All right. Uh, here's here's what I uh, am going to recommend. Uh, first of all, just like you look for just similarities of preferences and styles and tastes, you can also look for similarities of categories mm -hmm. by doing that search, that initial yes. search, and bring and bring it up. You. You're a boater, I'm a boater. Right, it's it. Whatever it, it could be. But there's another way that I that has been wildly successful in the marketing community. Maybe the most successful strategy for creating loyalty and uh, satisfaction with your product um, in the last decade. Co-creation. Where we ask people who have been who are our customers or even our prospective customers we want to create the next level of our product or service mm. can you give us some input and we ask for their responses uh you know on uh, what what can we do to make this better what can we do to uh, what should we drop away what should we what do we need to improve co-create the next level of our Smart. products or services Smart. that creates unity you are co-creating this thing it's probably uh, why it's probably why um you know crowdfunding and kickstarter and all these sites have done so well because someone puts out an idea and then says but also give us feedback so that when we ship it we've incorporated those ideas into making right. this product to your liking and yes. people get behind it they buy something they can't even get for a year they you know invest in something to be a part of the co-creation of of someone launching it they'll give feedback they'll be excited about it. they'll spend so much time and energy on one potential product that maybe they get Six to 12 months later. Right. Because they're a part and, of the co-creation. And here where we come to another one of those single word changes. If you ask for feedback, if you ask for uh, an opinion, you can get this effect. This, But there's one word you can use that enhances the effect significantly. Instead of asking for their opinion or their feedback, you ask for their advice, Ooh. and you get a partner. So don't ask for feedback, ask for advice. Ask for advice. When you ask for feedback, people take a half step away from you, and they go inside themselves, right? And they, they consider what their reactions are inside. If you ask for advice, they come and stand next to you. Mm. psychologically right that's interesting and now the, here's what the research shows if you ask for advice people like your idea better than if you ask for uh. Adv uh, feedback or uh, opinion about it <sighs> what do I, this stuff is fascinating to me I don't one know. word yes this stuff is fascinating to me if you were is there anything else about unity yeah that you would add to I would say that we don't want to let this go where it exists already. I'll give you an example of how it worked for me. Uh, a while ago, I was I had to complete a report, um, and it was uh, due the next day. And as I was reading over it, I saw there was one section that it was not really convincing. I wasn't. Mm. I really didn't make my case because I didn't have the research to support it, but I knew I had a colleague who had done a study the year before and had collected data relevant to this point that I, if I put that in, it would, it would close the envelope. It would be a sure thing. Sure. Well, this guy, let's call him Tim, that's not his real name, was known to be sour mm -hmm. and irascible and unpleasant guy. So I, I, I sent him an email. I said, Tim, uh, I explained my situation. I have this due the next day. You have the date. I'm going to call you and see how we can get this to me today so I can put it into my report. And I called him. He said, I know why you're calling, Bob. And the answer is no. He said, look, man, 
I can't be responsible for your poor time management skills wow. that it's due the next day and you don't have the data. He said, Does he? no. And before I read all the research on unity, I would have said, come on, Tim. It's due the next, It's I, I, I'm really in a bind here. It's due tomorrow. He had already said no to that, right? This is what I said. Honestly, you know, Tim, we've been in the same psychology department now for 12 years. <laughs> I really appreciate if you do this for me. Wow. And I had the data that afternoon. Wow, there you go. So he said no, and then you... Because I didn't raise to... Just like those researchers in Texas, and those, you know, the, the group that said, we're in a couple. We've been together for... Mm. I said... We've been together for 12 years in the same unit. And now, no when to yes. People, people feel more obligated or in, uh, persuaded to take the action. I think obligated. Mm. They feel out of loyalty to the group. Man, you have to do this. That's crazy. Otherwise, you're like a bad member of the group or something. Right. Oh, man. This is, why is human psychology so fascinating and powerful? And if it's can, always been fascinating to me. Isn't it crazy that you could have everyone, everything you want in your life, you could accomplish your goals, your dreams, you could, you could uh, have great partnerships, great friendships, great business opportunities if you learn to understand people and you learn to right. speak right. the language of people. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. And I want more people to learn about these things. I want more people to study it because – when you can study it and then integrate it into your daily life and just make it a part of who you are, it's going to feel like everything flows to you. It's going to feel like synchronicities are around you constantly. It's going to feel like life is abundant and you are a magnet for what you want. And I think, and, yeah, it's just so powerful. Yeah. And the best thing about it is that you get to be ethical in the process by simply pointing to the things that truly exist. We've been together for 12 years. That's right. In the same unit. Or, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we both like, uh, we're, we're both runners or, yes. we're, you know, or any of these things we've, we've yes. talked about, yes. right? You know, you, you just, it's not about manipulation. Hook. It's about, yeah, just reaffirming, connecting. Pointing to yeah, something. Yeah, pointing to something. The true social proof, true authority, true scarcity. That's all. Um, this is fascinating. I've got a few more questions for you. I feel like I feel like we've only been talking for 20 minutes, but it's been about an, almost an hour and 50 minutes now, and I've got a few more for you. I could talk about this stuff all day long. Um, I'm curious about... how to use some of this information to get the truth out of someone. Is there any, any research that you've done or practices that you've implemented where you can use some of these seven principles to see whether or not someone is telling the truth or to get them to be more honest about something, whether it's in business or, uh, or just in, yeah. in life. There is, um, you know, when we talk about reciprocation, the first thing we talked about, it turns out, that self-disclosure is reciprocal. If you begin by saying, you know, I'm going to be honest with you about mm -hmm. this, uh, this, 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 and that, people give you back. Mm -hmm. They disclose something about themselves that's honest, right? So it, it's, mm. it, again, you have to be first. Right. Just like giving a gift first and someone wants to give it in return, yeah. I, I use, I... I apply that on my show uh, where if I want someone to be vulnerable and open up about something, I always lead with vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. And I always lead with like something that may be hard to say in, in front of a, a stranger, like something I've been through or something I'm yeah. not proud of or a challenge yeah. I went through and how it made me feel. I try to open up about that so that others are willing to open up and be vulnerable right. as well. Right, right. I think that's, you know... So these are the things we've, we've talked about. You were saying, well, how do we really use these principles? Well, one is you have to know them. You have, mm -hmm. you have to know what they are. But then it becomes, if you start out with the, 
with with the value system that you described at the beginning, which is you be a ser- you be of service. You use them to steer people correctly, <laughs> you know, to things that they don't want to miss, to things that do have authorities who support it, to th- social proof that shows the popularity of what it is. The, then everybody's winning. Absolutely. Everyone's winning. Where in your life are you still struggling to implement some of this? You know, um, besides the praise, the praise still a challenge or is that, yeah, it's still something I have to fight with. I have to remember to do it every time in order to get that, to, to, um, be sure that people are properly acknowledged Mm. for their contributions, their, their thinking, what they have brought to the table. It's so easy to just go on uh, and, and, Take that without, uh, without appreciating it publicly. Uh, so that's what I, I, I have to fight to yeah. be sure that I don't do that anymore. And if someone listening or watching could only implement one of these principles on a daily basis, and you see would in, help them get incredible benefits, if they could only do one thing, what would that one be that you suggest that people get started with? Hopefully they can incorporate all seven, but if it was just so, one. So I would ask them to look to the one that's already there in the situation. Is there real scarcity that you can use? Is there real authority already? You've got all these testimonials. You've got all those credentials. Is there real social proof? Whatever it is, that's where you go. You go to the one that's its engine is running it's right there in the situation just waiting for you to harness it but there's one thing i would recommend as a general strategy as i have a colleague who has a teenage son and he said i wanted to give him some advice about going forward now that he's becoming an adult and i'm asking all of my friends for a piece of advice for him what would yours be bob right So um, here's what it would be. When you go into a situation where you don't know people, it's a new situation, unfamiliar, think the best of those people. Think the best and that that they they want to provide the best to you. If you think that, it allows you to be generous with them. And as soon as you are generous with them, there are two really important, maybe three important uh, downstream consequences. First of all, by the principle of reciprocity, they will want to be generous with you. Secondly, by giving them this gift of whatever it is, they will like you more and they will want to do business with you. And finally, after they see themselves doing business with you, they've made a commitment to you. They will want to continue to do business with somebody they like. And now you've got people interacting with one another who like one another and why trying to be generous with that with one another. I don't know how you get a better work environment than that. Absolutely. I love this. Uh, okay, a couple of final questions that I ask everyone at the end. Uh, but before I ask the questions, I want people to get the book, Influence. I've bought this for so many people. I've given it to so many people over the last decade. It's now updated, expanded with a lot of new research, information uh, that can really educate you on how to integrate and implement these principles into your life and your relationships and your business. So I want people to get the book, get a few copies for friends, Again, over 5 million copies already sold, lots of incredible praise and testimonials, and it's given me incredible results in my life. I'm trying to incorporate all the principles in influence by just letting you guys know all these things. Um, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a joy to, to connect with you, Robert, and have you on, and I hope to have you on in person again in the future sometime. This, this question is called the three truths question. I ask everyone at the end of the show. It's called the three truths. I'd like you to imagine a hypothetical scenario that you get to, uh, it's your last day on earth, many, many years away, and you get to live as long as you want, but eventually 
You gotta you gotta go on to the next place. And you've accomplished every dream you have, Robert. You've got all these dreams, goals, you the fulfillment, it all happens for you. But for whatever reason, you've got to take all of your written work, video, content, audio, it's all gotta go with you somewhere else. Or it's gotta go somewhere else, but it can't be here anymore. And you get to leave behind three lessons to the world, three things you know to be true from all your experiences and all your wisdom that you would leave behind. What would you say would be those three truths for you? Um, one is one that we've uh, just dis- described. Go into new situations thinking the best of people, so which allows you to be generous. All right. The second is also something we've talked about. Don't have a favorite principle of influence because to think that the same principle is going to work on all audiences with all histories with you, with all kites, types, of, types of products and services, no. You, you choose the one that's in there first. Right? You, 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 the, the, the thing that's, that's already there. Mm-hmm. And the final one really has to do with uh, another book that I wrote called Presuasion. Mm-hmm. And it is that there is a, a, people think that the way to make an, a, 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 an appeal or a message more successful is what you put into the message. And that's those seven principles, mm. right? So that's true. But it turns out there's research to show what you say or do before you ever send your message puts people in a mindset that is consistent with your message. Mm. And then that message becomes even more successful. So what I would say is think about arranging for people to be in a state of mind that's consistent with the central feature of your message before you send it. Right. So if it's about... uh, It's about uh, scarcity. So, for example, there was a study that showed that if you have a message asking people to take a stand that, uh, or to purchase something that's scarce, if you send them an email with two ticking down clock emojis in the subject line, they become 15% more likely to buy a scarce opportunity. Wow. Because you've put them in mind of That's scarcity. That's interesting. Yeah. <sighs> I love this stuff. This is fascinating for me. Um, I've got one final question for you, but I want to make sure people get the book. They can go online uh, and get influenced, the new and expanded version, The Psychology of Persuasion. They can follow you on social media, Robert Cialdini on Twitter. Facebook as well. Are you on Instagram also? I'm not sure. Yeah, we are. But I think the best place is uh, our our website, influenceatwork.com. Influenceatwork.com. Go there. Yeah. You can opt in for the newsletter. You can get all the information. There's got data, Everything. research, right. all the papers are there, all that stuff. Um, you are you are the the godfather of influence. A lot of people call you, and and uh, it's been it's been fun to watch. Uh, your journey, as I've started my journey to discover your journey uh, and decades of research and work that you put in long before, you know, I got into this, and it's been fun to implement your research and your findings and really see incredible benefits. So I appreciate that, and I and I want to acknowledge you, Robert, for the consistency of your efforts, the consistency and your dedication to finding the answers, to finding solutions on how we can improve the quality of our life, improve the quality of our business, our relationships, through these practical and influential, uh, I guess, psychological principles. And uh, I'm just so grateful that that you continue to show up in the way you do, and then you continue to speak this message, that you speak about it, you write about it, and, uh, and continue to offer us tools to improve these different areas of our lives. So I really acknowledge you for how you've shown up in the world. It's, it's amazing, Robert. And my final question for you 
is what's your definition of greatness? Um, I would say the ability to transcend your circumstances, mm. not to be imprisoned or to have a stealing based on the circumstances that have been dealt to you, that you can get above and beyond those circumstances. Yeah. Robert, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Good. I enjoyed it. And then the other thing too that helps with conversations is something called adaptability, which a lot of people don't have. Like if I have a con I have a conversation with you and I specifically want to know one thing, but you want to tell me a whole other story around it, people don't have the patience. And so like, no, 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 no. We're talking about something else. Like stick, stick to the topic.